starting in verse 18 is where we will begin our lesson this evening. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph, son of Jacob, son of Mephah, son of David, he was perched very firmly on his big sturdy branch near the trunk of the tree. It was a thick branch, sturdy reliable, perfect for sitting, and it was so strong. It didn't tremble when the storms came, nor did it shake when the winds blew. No, this branch that old Joseph was on was very predictable, very solid, and he had no intention of leaving it. That is, until he was, go until he was told to go out on a limb. As he sat securely on his branch, he looked up and he looked out on that limb that God wanted him to go out on here in Matthew chapter 1. Joseph had never seen a branch so thin. And he said to himself, that's no place for a man to go. There's no place to sit. There's no protection for the elements. How could you sleep dangling from that quivering little twig up there? He inched back, leaned against the trunk of the tree, and pondered the situation. Maybe out of self-defense, he said to himself, Who will believe me? What will our families think? Maybe common sense told him not to go out on that end because he said to himself again, he says, Conceived by the Holy Spirit? Come on, you've got to be kidding me. Convenience told him not to get out on that limb because he was thinking to himself, just when I was hoping to settle down and raise a family, this all happened. And maybe pride told him not to do it as well because thoughts like this may have been creeping into his head. If Mary expects me to believe that story, she's got another thing coming. But you see, it wasn't just anybody that told Joseph to get up out on that limb. It was God who told him to get out on that limb. And that's what he wrestled with. But he wrestled with it because he was happy where he was at. Life next to the trunk was good. His branch was big enough to allow him to sit in comfort. It allowed him all the conveniences that he thought he deserved in life. Now it shifts to us. Do we know the imbalance that comes from having one foot in our own will and one foot in the Father's will. You see, it can't be done. See, the Lord wants us up out on that limb. It is God who nudges us. We at all time, we at, at one time or another, we have all sunk our fingernails into the bark of that trunk of that tree. We all have done it. We've gripped it and we've got it and we're not going anywhere. When the Lord says, I want you out on that limb, you're going, I don't want to go. 
Joseph was there. We grow accustomed to it. Joseph had grown accustomed to it. We like our branch. Joseph liked his branch. But still it's God that does the nudging. See, we hear the call. God does the nudging. He pushes us and says, take a stand. Do something right. There's the branch you have to get up on. And so he pushes us. Take a stand and do something right. And do it for me. Do it in my son's name. Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Take a stand. Do something right. And God nudges us. He says, that's the branch I want you out on. And then he says again, he goes, he nudges us again. And he says, forgive. And he says, it doesn't matter who hurt who first. What matters is, is that you go and you build that bridge. Go. And he keeps shoving us. He keeps pushing us. And he keeps pointing us out to that branch and says, see that branch right? Forgive. I don't care who hurt who first. Take care of it. Build the bridge that needs to be built. As you would that men should do to you, do even so to them. Matthew chapter uh, 6 and verse 12. In other words, practice the golden rule and forgive. Do what you're supposed to do and forgive. And again then, we hear, we, we, don't, we hear the call and then we feel the nudge and, and the Lord keeps pushing us and he says, get up on this branch. Evangelize. Oh. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out on that twig. It'll hold you. I'll help it hold you. Evangelize. Go meet someone. Go talk to someone. Step out and do something different for my cause and my kingdom. And the Lord just keeps nudging. And he says, get up out on that branch. Get out on that limb. And then, he, and then he says it again. He says, go. And he keeps pushing. And he says, sacrifice. He says, take food off of your table and give it to someone who doesn't have it. And he just keeps pushing. And he says, that's the branch. That's the limb that I want you out on. Regardless of the nature of the call, the consequences are the same. Even we wrestle with it. We may do the same things that Joseph did. Our heart may say yes, but our feet say no. Excuses blow as numerously as leaves on an autumn breeze. But you know what? When all was said and done, Joseph chose the Father's will. And that's what we have got to do. He chose to leave the comfort of that big, huge branch down there and the, the comfort of the trunk of that tree that he had his arms wrapped around on. And he looked up and he looked down and he started to climb and he went out on that limb. And that's what we've got to do to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. We've got to get ourselves up and out on that limb. Joseph knew that the only thing worse than a venture into the unknown was the thought of denying his master and God. It should be our attitude. It was the God of his fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God of the 12 tribes of Israel. The God of his great, 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 great grandfather. And he knew it. And it was the angel from that God that kept pushing Joseph and he said, you've got to get up out on that branch. Take Mary. You're not going to put her away privately. You're going to marry her. And then you're not going to have sex with her for nine months until that baby's born. So what did Joseph do? He took cold showers. Only they didn't have showers. He dipped in the river Kishon, which is near Nazareth. Or he dipped in the cold rivers of... See what I'm saying? Because God nudged him and said, you get up out on that branch. Because something special is going to happen. Only Joseph's faith in God was the safety net as he went up out on that limb. And it's our faith in God that is our safety net as well. Therefore, we have nothing to fear unless our faith is weak. And it's not much of a safety net. So strengthen your faith. Get into the Word. Put the roots way down deep into that Word because it comes. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. 
then you'll have your safety net. And as things turned out, listen, Joseph's fears were justified, weren't they? The limb was, that he was out on was a pretty skinny one. The Messiah was to be born to Mary, to be raised in his home. For nine months, Joseph was going to run down to the river Kishon, take his little dip, and abstain from knowing his wife. Then he was going to learn how to speak Egyptian. For two years, they were wandering around down in Egypt. That's a pretty skinny limp. He had to push away the sheep and clear out the cow manure so his wife would have a place to give birth. See, again, you've got to, you've got to see this stuff. You know, the life and times of Jesus, the Bible was not written in a vacuum. That's what happened. For him to be born and for him to lay in a manger, Joseph had to do some house cleaning out in that barn. There was no room in the inn, so they were in the barn. And Joseph's shuffling all that stuff around. He's clearing a path for Mary, and that baby's born, and they lay him in a manger. A manger's nothing more than a feed trough. So he had to empty the feed trough or get something in it. Suitable for a young child, soon to be in swaddling clothes. He became a fugitive of the law. He became a student of Egyptian for two years. In other words, he went up on a limb, and that limb was just shaken. His fears were justified, because not everything went the way I'm sure he thought his life was going to go. But God said, you get up on that limb. And Joseph went. At times, that limb must have bounced and swayed as if it was in a hurricane. But Joseph held on, and I'm sure he closed his eyes every night, hanging onto that branch, and prayed to the Father for strength. But you can be sure of one thing. Joseph never regretted it. Sweet was the reward for his courage and faith. One look into the face of that heavenly toddler. Remember, the Bible wasn't written in the vacuum. Jesus grew up. He started as a baby. One look into the face of that heavenly toddler, and he knew he would do it all over again. If the Lord touched him again, he says, I'll do it again. This going out on a limb has never been easy. Just ask Joseph. You read this story. He was on a pretty skinny limb. Better yet, ask Jesus. He knows better than anyone the cost of going out on a limb. And his limb just happened to be a tree on Mount Calvary. There's the limb he was out on. Listen to Jesus as he tells us to love our neighbor. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 31, love your neighbor as yourself. And it was spoken by a man whose neighbors in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4 verse 29 after he had gotten through reading scripture in the synagogue as his custom was wanted to run him out of town, wanted to kill him. Because he says, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And they were all scratching their head. Wait a minute, isn't this the carpenter's kid? Doesn't he live down the block from us? How dare he say something like that? This is the same Jesus who says, love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to Jesus if you, know what, if you want to know what it costs to hang out on that limb, this is the same Jesus who put the challenge to leave family and friends for the sake of the gospel to his disciples. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 29, they all said, well, we've left all, O Lord, to follow you. Peter's words. It was issued by one who must have, at some point, in the book of Luke, it says he began to be about 30 years of age, at some point, he goes back to the carpenter shop, throws the door open, steps inside, looks around one last time. And do you get the idea, I do, that at some point he closed his eyes and he thought of all the sweet memories that were in that carpenter shop, running around on the heels of his father Joseph while he was still alive, learning the trade, you get the idea he might have grabbed a fistful of sawdust and to 
take a deep breath, go back down. Looked over on the wall, saw his apron, his work apron, and pulled a nail out of it, rolled it between his fingers. And said, I wonder what it's going to feel like three and a half years from now, going into my flesh and seeing you put it back. And you know, here's the same man who says, you got to leave all. you got to leave your family behind. You have to leave all for me. You have to sacrifice and put it all on the altar for me. And this is the one who at some point, he turns. And he sees his mom, Mary, standing in the door. And their eyes meet. She doesn't say a word. He doesn't say a word. Because for 30 years, Mary has been contemplating his life, everything that's happened, everything she's ever heard, everything she's ever seen. And she looks at Jesus, and Jesus looks at her, and they don't say a word because she knows he's got to leave. And he knows he has to leave. probably did. And Mary bid her son farewell. And Jesus was gone, never to return home like that again. Never to be like that again. Jesus left knowing things would never be the same again. And so, when he asks us to put everything on the altar of sacrifice, he's already done. This is Jesus who says, pray for those who persecute you in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. It comes from the lips of those that would be asking to forgive the murderers of himself. He goes, forgive others who persecute you, who despitefully use you, love your enemies. He's hanging on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that was a prayer to the Father. So we prayed for even those that were taking part in his murder that day. This is Jesus. Listen to him. He says, I am with you always. These are the words of a God who did in one instant the impossible. Word becoming flesh, John chapter 1, verse 14. And then living a life and dying for us. In one moment, he did the impossible. He cleansed our sins. It wasn't possible any other way. Only through the death of Jesus. Y'all listen to him. So when he says, love your neighbor, he knows what he's talking about. When he says, leave your family, he knows what he's talking about. He says, pray for those who persecute you. And he knows what he's talking about. He says, I am with you always. And he knows what he's talking about. And he says, now get up out on that limb for me. The world will see another transformation someday. You see, in becoming man, God made it possible for mankind to see him. When Jesus went home, Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, he ascended back to the Father. He left the door open behind him so we could follow him one day. 1 Corinthians 15. When in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. The corruptible will put on incorruption. The mortal will put on immortality. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Jesus did that. Take him down now, soldier. I'll take care of him. 
The afternoon sun is still high as they stand silently on the hill. It's much quieter now than it was earlier in the day. Most of the crowd has left. The thieves gasp and groan as they hang near death now that their legs have been broken. A soldier leans a ladder against the center pole, climbs it, removes the stake that holds the beam to the upright part of the cross. Two of the other soldiers, glad that the day's work is nearing its completion, assist with the heavy and awkward chore of laying the cypress cross piece and the body on the ground. Careful now, says Joseph. The six-inch spikes are wrenched from the hardwood, freeing up the now lifeless hands. The body that encased the Savior is lifted onto a large rock. He's yours, says the sentry. The cross piece is set aside, soon to be carried off into the supply room until it is needed once again. These two men are not accustomed to this type of work, yet somehow their hands move quickly to their tasks. Joseph of Arimathea kneels behind the head of Jesus and tenderly wipes the wounded face. With a soft, wet cloth, he cleans the blood that came from the lashings and from the crown of thorns. With this done, he closes the eyes tight by running his hand over the Lord's face. Nicodemus unrolls some linen cloths that Joseph brought and places it all on the rock beside the body. The two Jewish leaders lift the lifeless body of Jesus and set it on some of the strips of cloth laying Parts of the body are now anointed with perfumed spices. As Nicodemus touches the cheeks of the master with aloe, the emotions he has been containing escapes. His own tears fall on the face of the crucified king. He pauses to brush another one away. These two men <coughs> stand up and look longingly. conducted not by those who had boasted they would never leave, but by two members of the Sanhedrin Council, two representatives of the religious group that helped orchestrate the execution of our Messiah. But Joseph and Nicodemus took their first steps out onto the limb for God, and it was a sizable risk for them. The high society of Jerusalem weren't going to take too kindly to two of their own burying a revolutionary. But for Joseph and Nicodemus, the choice was obvious. The teaching of this young preacher from Nazareth rang with the truth that they had not heard in their dark cave of Phariseeism that had become their faith. They didn't like it. They were going to break free. So they lifted the body slowly and carried it to the unused tomb. And in doing so, lit a candle and pulled the bushel basket back for all to see it. Remember the words of Jesus No man lights a candle, puts it under a bushel, put it on a candlestick so that it gives light to all that are in the house. So Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus light that candle. They took the risk and probably never regretted it. I think of another young man full of anger and bitterness and hatred towards the followers of Jesus was on his way to Damascus with authority, letters, warrants for the arrest of anyone who named the name of Jesus Christ. And on the road to Damascus, we know he was struck down. For three days and three nights, he fasted and prayed. 
He got his little nudge. Here's Jesus says, I'm Jesus, who you persecute. It's hard for you to keep running your foot into those thorns. Get up out on the limb that I'm going to tell you to get out on. And so the Lord pushed and says, get out there and climb that. Ananias was a man who was pushed. He didn't want to go see Saul of Tarsus. He says, I've heard a lot of things about this old boy. He's come up here to arrest guys like me. Do you want me to go see him? He wanted, he wanted to grab that trunk too. He didn't want to let go. The Lord said, get up on that limb. And Ananias is going, no. I don't want to be out there. And the Lord said, you've got to go. And he cajoled and he nudged and he says, you've got to go see him. I am going to show him how many things he will suffer for my name's sake. You've got to go. You're the one. And so Ananias wrestles within himself, asks all the same questions that Joseph might have, that, jo that Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus might have. They wrestled with those inner turmoils and says, all right, Ananias went. laid his hands on Saul. What looked like the scales fell from his eyes and we know that in then Paul's version of the story, we don't get it in Acts 9, but we get it later. When Paul recounts the conversion, Ananias says, why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Call him on the name of the Lord. So the Lord nudged Ananias and says, you've got to get up on that limb. Then he nudged Saul of Tarsus and said, you're going to get out on the limb too. And it's going to be real shaky. But your faith will carry you through. So Saul of Tarsus was baptized. We know him as Paul the Apostle in his life. Again, it didn't get better when he became a Christian physically, but it sure got better spiritually. He said things like, I don't want to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He talked to the Romans and he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. So when he got nudged, he climbed up out on that limb, and God used him, and used him, and used him for his glory. There's no telling how many thousands of souls that the gospel that came out of Paul's mouth was responsible for converting. And the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. No telling how many thousands Paul influenced to do just that by sharing the gospel message and getting out on that land. Amazing, isn't it? This is what God asks us to do. He's nudging us. He keeps pushing. He says, let go. Her hold on. He keeps going, let go. He says, I don't want to. Let go. Get up out on that limb. Do something for me. Make your life count for my son Jesus Christ who voluntarily died for us all. Go do it. You'll never regret it. See, Joseph was a man of faith. Ananias, man of faith. Paul the Apostle, man of faith. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, we had no knowledge of them whatsoever after this, but they had to be men of faith. There's a lot of things we don't know in Scripture that are not revealed to us, and that's okay. We don't need to know everything. In fact, John, you know, his, his gospel, said, if I were to tell you everything, the world couldn't contain the volumes that I would write. He says, but these things are written so that you might believe. You might have life through his name. 
We need to take the risk. We need to get out on our limb. We need to light our candle. We need to do what God nudges us to do through his word. And he keeps pushing. He says, my word says this. Now get out there and do it. My word says this. You've got to get out there and do it. He keeps pushing. He says, get up out there on that limb. You won't regret it. Service to me is always rewarding. And of course, when Paul's life was over, Paul writes Timothy, and he says he's ready to be offered. The time of his departure was at hand. He knew what was coming. He fought a good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day. Not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. That's you and I. Here we are, 1950-odd years later. And those words are us. Unto all them also that love is appearing. Will we love is appearing? Because we are up out on that limb that God has told us to get out on, and serve Him, and glorify Him with our lives. Take the risk, light the candle, get it out from underneath the bushel, get up out on that limb, and live for Jesus. And that is true discipleship. That's what we all need. Best is yet to come. Heaven awaits us all if we fight the fight, finish the course, and keep the faith. The best is yet to come. What's your need tonight? You need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Saul probably battled with that three days and three nights. Fasting and praying, you know, he was battling those things. He was wrestling with them inside, going, what have I seen? And then he's like, what have I done? This is what he remembered throughout his ministry. But he didn't get bogged down in his failures. He didn't let that weigh him down like an anchor. He mentioned it. He goes, yeah, I'm chief of sinners. I persecuted the church. But now I want to know the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now I want to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now I live my life as a crucified one. Galatians 2.20, the life which I live now by faith, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ. Paul understood all of those wrestlings. He wrestled for three days and three nights fasting and praying. Be a disciple or not. To do what the Lord tells him to do or not. To get up out on that limb or not. And again, we wrestle too with the same things. To do the Father's will or not. Remember I said from the very beginning, it must have been an imbalanced situation to have one foot in your own will and one foot in the Father's will because you realize what's going to happen. It can't be done going one way or the other. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 6. You can't serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and the flesh at the same time. It just cannot be done. So you end up picking one foot up or the other and putting two feet on one side or the other because there's no other way. So which side are you on? The side of true discipleship, ready to serve Jesus at all costs, make any sacrifice necessary. Or are you still fighting your own will? Holding on to the trunk of that tree. And when the Lord nudges, the fingernails just keep digging deeper and deeper into the bark. You won't let go. I like my life the way it is. But Jesus says, get up out on that branch. Get out on the limb. For me, the one who died for you. The one who bled out for you. The one who cleansed you from all your unrighteousness and sin. Serve me. The invitation is yours. If you're a child of God already, struggling with your discipleship, come. We'll pray with you and pray for you. If you're not a Christian, become one. Be a true disciple. Become one today by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Be serving the greatest master, the greatest saint, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ.